Hey everyone, welcome to the Mike Rose Art Show. Welcome back. It's been, what, uh, a week? Because it's been a week every single week that I go live. Um, this is the Mike Rose Art Show where I go live and talk about whatever's on my mind. Oftentimes you jump in the questions and uh, I answer those questions. So that's what this is about. This is a free coaching session, free like chance for me to just vent and it's my weekly time to connect with you guys in a live uh, format. So. Sorry, I'm two minutes late. I was, uh, hey, good to see you guys on. See everyone jumping in. I'll give everyone a few seconds here to uh, to catch up. I should probably go back, like the good streamers go back and clip like the first 60 seconds off of their, uh, <laughs> where's Waldo? Yeah, I got the Waldo shirt on today. You found me, I'm your personal finance guru on the internet for, for Canada there, so you found me. And uh, hey guys, good to see you all on. Sorry I'm a few minutes late, I was just dealing with some minor uh, issues. It's interesting, the more success you get and the more you put yourself out there on social media, the more the people attack you. So that's just like an interesting observation I'm gonna put out there and some stuff I've been dealing with on that. If you're gonna be successful and you wanna do the social media thing, be very thoughtful with how you put things out there. But uh, today's video, and I, don't, I usually don't even clip these, like I don't keyword them, I don't tag them. Uh, but I should start tagging the Mike Rosehart live streams. We should start throwing tags in there and keywording them and making proper descriptions because I've been experimenting with different titles and I've been having much more success than saying like the Mike Rosehart show live. Instead, I go with the catchy title that the video is about, which today's topic I want to talk about, and I might even go over to the whiteboard, is two things. One, the market is cooling. That's a fact. Two, what do you do in a cooling market or in a recession? What do you do? So that's something we're gonna talk about from a personal finance um, perspective. But we can also talk about other things that, you know, whatever's going on in your guys' lives, that's what I'm here for. Uh, excited to move to the new house, excited to, to downsize a bit of the stress, like things have been getting better. Every week I've been slowly offloading a lot of my day-to-day -day activities. I now have an assistant, and it's nice also to have, uh, we're outsourcing a lot of the management stuff to a, a partner who can do it better than we can, and so that's, that's been great too. So I'm really excited to do all that stuff. But okay. So, hey, good to see you on. Hey, Mike. Hey, Waldo. What up? Hey, Tommy. Hey, Daniel. Hey, John. And uh, yeah, so the market is cooling. And I didn't just mean that it's getting cold because they are correlated. And you're gonna see this Saturday, I think it's this Saturday, we're gonna be dropping the video that I did on when is the best time to buy. So how do you time the market? And I don't mean time the market, I mean seasonally, is there a better time to buy? And it's a fact there is. Uh, there's a bad time to sell and a bad time to buy and a good time to sell and a good time to buy. And here I am selling my house, listed right now, and uh, not the best time to be selling, but um, good time to be buying. The market is cooling. We're starting to see offers on properties below asking. We're starting to see a bit more flexibility and how creative we can be with deals. Whereas before it was like all offers on this day and like 10 people would offer and it would go crazy over asking and there'd be no options for conditions or anything to be creative. Now we can be creative. Now we can negotiate. Now there's a bit of back and forth. It's my favorite type of real estate investing. I hate, hate, hate investing in real estate in the last two years. It's been terrible. What's up Future Wiz? Good to see you on. Uh, it's, it's been terrible. Like. There's no creativity, there's no hard work for the agents. Like the agents just put it out there and then like get 10 offers and that's it. There's no work and the fun is in the hunt. I actually enjoy the negotiation, I enjoy the thrill of that and so in a lower, you know, a balanced market or a recession, that just heats right up. Like all my investors who've been watching loyally for the last year and a half, holding on to their, their money, saying like, I don't know whether I should invest, the market's gonna start cooling. Now's the time to start dollar cost averaging and buying. As things get cool in the winter, I don't know if the spring is gonna pick up again, but I know things are cooling right now. I know there are more opportunities for cash flow in properties than I've seen in a long time. Now, there's still a ton of garbage. Like, don't get me wrong, the market is full of garbage. Like, 80% of listings suck. But, where I saw 5% of the listings being solid before, I'm now seeing 10 or 15% being viable from a cash flow perspective, starting to see a, you know, the rents have caught up to the prices and things are starting to be uh, a good signal. What you don't want is where the rent to price ratio is way out of whack. That's where you gotta stay away. That's where you gotta, gotta be careful, especially if you're not buying for cash flow. And like, I only buy for cash flow. So what do we do in a recession? The second part of, and we can go into this for like a whole hour. I don't know how long this stream's gonna be. It might be a short one, it might be a little longer, we'll see. 
um, you know, I can go into like, what do you do in a recession? Like, what is that thing that, you know, keeps you buoyant in times of recession? Well, one, emergency funds. Please, if you can, go get an unsecured line of credit. If you have a job right now or you have any way to qualify, even if you have a small business, go open a small business. Go into the bank and get a 30, you can get like a 20 or $30,000 line of credit on any business you open right now. I'm talking, open up like Mike's dog walking. I walk into BMO, walk into TD. These guys are handing out like 10, $15,000 lines of credits to businesses, small businesses, like it's candy. So that's the first thing is like, just get a business card and create a business and get some access to unsecured line of credit. But the second thing, you don't have to use it, just have it there. Because in a recession, cash is king, right? And no one has any cash. All the banks tighten up, everyone tightens up. Whatever you've got, you can keep. So hold on to the cash and the credit facilities you can get now. The bank is handing out money and it's cheap. Have you guys looked at the cost of interest right now? The cost of interest is super low, so it's a great time to be levering up and getting debt. Debt is super cheap. We got like Meridian Credit Union right now has got a 2.49 five year fixed. 2.49% for five years fixed on a 25 year mortgage. Those rates are unheard of. I, I saw some, some products that were like 2.29 five year, uh, 2.39 five year fixed for sure. I think it might've been 2.29 even. When we're getting to two year products that are below 2%, 1.99%, that kind of money is like free. Take the money, plus go get some unsecured lines of credits. I, I go to the, all the banks, get 5,000, 10,000 at each bank and slowly increase it over time. Getting, like I have access right now to you know six figures in unsecured lines of credits. Unsecured being tied to no property, as in they're just gonna give me the money based on my good word, based on my name, based on you know, your income typically or your assets. So they don't secure it to anything, unsecured. That money is great to tap into to buy property or whatever you wanna do with that money, you need it for renovations, just to have that cash available. In a recession, no one wants to hand out money. So the guy who has money has everything. And so what I don't want to see you see happen is my subscribers on here that just are levering up getting tons of properties now, don't push yourself past the point of comfort. Don't go to the point where you have no money in your bank account and you don't have any secure, unsecured lines of credit. So you have no access to cash because then your furnace goes, then a roof goes, then a tenant trashes your unit. By the way, on Matt McKeever's channel soon, we're gonna be having a video come out in like two weeks. Um, by the way, sorry I forgot my, I don't have my microphone, I, Kyle's got it. So unfortunately we don't have the microphone today. I'm literally just like live on speakerphone on my phone. But um, the point I was making, lost my train of thought. Uh, someone remind me what I was just about to say. I was talking about, I don't even know. I lost my entire train of thought talking about like levering or something. Um, ooh, leverage. Okay. So yeah. So speaking of Matt's video, one of my units got trashed as a good example. It was the whole CBC article. The other tenant that they didn't write the piece on, they're just like talking to me about being like a, you know, involved in this as a, as a realtor or whatever, as an investor, as whatever. And uh, on, on one side, you're seeing that Okay, the point I was gonna make was, the tenant destroyed the unit, $10,000 in damage. You can see on my Instagram stories, the condition of the unit. You'll watch that video, you'll see the condition of that unit. And my point was in a recession, that $10,000 hit and maybe a month or two of vacancy to fix that unit up, that could force you to have to sell. And those who sell in times of recession lose money. Someone told me once, you only ever lose when you sell. And so if you own a stock and it goes in half, you haven't lost anything till you've sold, till you've locked in that loss. It could recover, you don't know, right? As per tax purposes, there is no loss until a sale, right? So we know that until you sell, you don't lose. So if you hold in times of recession and you have cash flow in your properties and you have contingency funds, meaning you have spare cash or access to cash and unsecured lines of credits, you can weather a recession. And maybe that recession's a year, two years, three years, you don't care because you're getting strong, positive cash flow. The same is true from your portfolio. If you're retired and you're living on a stock portfolio, do you, what, what do you do in a recession? You don't sell. You never sell the principal. What happens in a recession? Dividends remain the same. Yields go up in times of recession. Dividend yield goes up because the price of stocks goes in half typically, right? In 2008, we followed the data, 2000, early 90s, et cetera and so forth. The stock prices drop, but the dividends remain relatively consistent on average, on the aggregate, right? Guys are still paying four and 5% dividends. So if you had one year's living expense emergency funds in unsecured line of credit, now imagine if 
you had say $100,000 in unsecured lines of credit, so you could tap into at five or 6%. Now that sounds terrible to, to live off that, but in times of recession, you don't wanna be selling, you know, the 4% safe withdrawal rate assumes that you'll sell on occasion portions of your, of your gains, like when you make gains, right? In a recession, you don't have those capital appreciation gains. You wanna hold and wait for the recovery. So you don't wanna sell any stock to live on. You don't even wanna pull from your portfolio. You wanna reinvest everything you can, including the dividends, reinvest back in. If you have one or two years living expenses in unsecured line of credit, just you're not using it, it's just there. You could use it if you need to. You could weather a 2008 all the way to 2010 or 11 without touching your portfolio and watch as you double down with all your dividends reinvested, even if they cut dividends, which like there'll be some minor cuts, but that'll lag like six months to a year out. So you'll see some small dividend yield cuts, but as a percentage, it'll still be relatively solid. So you'll see recovery, right? In like a two years, max three years. You look at like 2008, the bottoms of, the, the highs of 2007 were matched by 2011. As in we're back to the highs again within three or four years. That's typically what we see, right? So we know that if you hold, you win. The people who lose in recession are the people that have to sell or who aren't diversified. If you own like all your shares in like Lehman Brothers and five other companies, okay, you're screwed. Like you were dumb though, so you deserve what happened to you. <laughs> you should be diversified. You should own hundreds of different stocks or own indexes that own hundreds or thousands of different stocks in many different economies, not just the United States, not just Canada. I'm talking about Brazil, Russia, India, China, emerging markets focused on high growth, stable blue chip, you know, commodities versus you know, a little bit of gold and silver in your portfolio. All these different things you want to have in your portfolio to be resilient through a recession. But as long as you're diversified and resilient, every portfolio that's diversified recovered ever. 1920s, 1930s, every single depression and recession ever, it all recovered if you were diversified and patient. So if you're diversified and patient and you're a loyal subscriber, which I know that you guys are, and you hear my, my words every single week for like almost two years, um, or I guess at least a year and a half anyway, we're coming up on two years, start of March next year, that's pretty crazy. But uh, if you've been following all that, you know that the secret to wealth is wealth preservation. And wealth preservation means what do you do in a recession? You guys already know, you know you don't sell. You double down. In fact, you keep buying. Like all my investors out there, I, there's a lot of you guys who have a lot of wealth. When the next recession comes in real estate, and they may be, likely they'll be tied. The Canadian economy will probably be tied to the Canadian real estate. So if, if the stock market takes a tank, probably the real estate market will take a tank too, but they're not necessarily guaranteed, right? Like high interest rates, or low GDP of like London or a specific area, like unemployment rates spiking in an area could have effects on that local real estate economy without affecting all of Canada, right? We've had some, uh, you know, in, in the, what do you call it? Uh, New Brunswick and East provinces like Newfoundland and places like that, they've experienced a bit of a slowdown economically, but here in like Toronto area, London area, we've not experienced that at all. And so it's been like a roaring economy. And so the overall Canadian economy has done well, even though certain provinces might be down. So local real estate markets could be affected differently. But the piece to remember is that everything bounces back so long as the area is desirable to live. So people always will want to live in Canada, I believe. And so Canada's real estate market is strong. Long term, it will rebound. Affordability will eventually balance, right? So it'll eventually balance out and you'll be fine. And if you have cash flow, significant cash flow in your properties, you can afford vacancies and things like that. So how do we think through a recession? It's painful, yes. Like to watch your properties be worth 80 cents on the dollar of what they were before. And hopefully you bought smart so that you're just down to par, but let's say you didn't buy smart. Or those stocks, let's say you bought some stocks and they're down now 20 or 30%. How do you handle that? It feels bad, right? Like in your heart, you're like, oh, that hurts. But you know that you haven't sold, so you haven't lost. And the key is to holding out until you've got a recovery. And that's why it's always good to have cash reserves. That's the number one thing. Have one to two years living expenses set aside. I don't recommend in cash. Like everyone talks about this emergency fund and all the personal finance bloggers are like, oh, put like six months cash in an emergency fund. And like, that's so great. And Dave Ramsey's like, blah, 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 no debt. So great. That's actually not prudent or smart because your money is sitting there degrading to inflation at a rate of almost 3% a year. That's a negative return on your money. Now I need to see positive return on my money. So I don't like to have cash. I will keep availability to cash. Like I might have HELOCs, home equity lines of credits, or access to lines of credits, or access to capital, that's good, right? If I have a stock portfolio for a million bucks and I go get a line of credit on it for 650, 
from my wealth uh, private banking, then I have access to that money without having to sell those stocks. I can get access to the capital. Same is true for unsecured debt. So you can go get unsecured lines of credits and you have access to that capital without having to use your own cash. Do not keep cash. Like I know Warren Buffett talks about keeping cash and he, he makes a good point. You probably don't have the opportunity that Warren Buffett has. He keeps a large reserve of cash available because he's ready to jump on an opportunity when it comes, right? And I keep a little bit more cash than I should, more than I would like, more than I recommend to you guys because I may have a deal that I have to jump on at any time in real estate. People call me and there's really good deals. So I keep a little bit of cash reserve where I shouldn't. Where the average fire follower, the average person who's early retired, financially independent, you don't need large cash reserves. In fact, you need no cash. Like so little cash that you have, a, I would actually use my main bank account as, a, as my line of credit. Like I would literally close my bank account down, pay no fees and keep a line of credit open. And it's free, there's no banking fees to use a line of credit, believe it or not. So pro tip, go open a line of credit. I have one at Scotiabank, I pay no fees, nothing. And whenever I go borrow money, they even will give me like free checks and stuff because I'm borrowing money. They're making income whenever I borrow. And so if I have a positive balance on my line of credit, that's fine. It doesn't cost anything to deposit. It costs nothing to withdraw from your line of credit. So I don't, you don't even need a bank account. You can just use like a line of credit, like a $60,000 line of credit as your main bank account. You get a debit card for it. And just use that line of credit card as your flow. And so all your cash is invested. You don't need to worry about it degrading to inflation. Whenever you need money, you use the bank's money and you pay it back with the passive income you have coming in so on and so forth, but you're not tying up cash, wasting it in an emergency fund. It's gross. People keep like hundred thousand dollars in an emergency fund. That's silly. Just have good access to credit. And if you don't need the credit, okay, pay it back. You know, if you don't need the cash, you don't need the emergency fund, it sits there. It's not costing you anything. It's the bank's money that you're borrowing at a cheap rate. And so that's been something that I've always recommended is having access to cash being a big cornerstone of surviving any recession. Lack of liquidity, Right? Lack of cash is what basically crushes people and businesses in times of recession. So have access to cash. But again, I'm not a big fan of keeping cash, just hoarding cash. It's, it's a bad idea. Keep your cash invested. Don't, don't keep cash. It, it, don't keep it under the mattress. Don't, unless it's like a small amount of money. Okay, a little bit, no problem. But like, don't keep large amounts of cash. Sing your savings account or your checking account earning like 1% or nothing or like in your checking account or nothing or like, ugh. yeah, just don't do it. Okay. Question and answer time. Hey guys. Good to see you on. Okay. So Tommy asked, can you talk about furnaces and water heaters and buying high efficient in terms of maintenance gas bills? If you're fronting it for a rental and water bills. Okay. So I think your question is talking about are high efficiency furnaces worth it. It depends if you're not paying utility bills, you probably won't see a good return on your money. If you are paying utility bills, then you could see a good return on your money. If you have a 1990s furnace, so a 20 year old furnace that's mid efficient, which is pretty typical for the era, it's probably 80 to 85% efficient. The upgrade from 80 to 85% efficient to 95% high efficiency is not that like drastic from a gas consumption perspective. From a hydro perspective, the new two stage high efficiency um, what do you call them? Furnaces that have the blower but it goes like on, on low speed, just kind of blows and has a higher speed as well. When it stays on mostly the low speed, that's a lot more hydro efficient. Believe it or not, the largest cost to run a furnace is hydro, not gas. You think, well, it means heating it with gas. Yes, but the fan is actually what draws most of the consumption. So you can see hydro. I've, I've heard between 20 and 50 bucks a month by upgrading from an older one. Now, if you've got an old 1960s furnace, I would just say it makes a lot more sense to to upgrade that. Like it, it could break at any moment. Um, do you want to be in that position in the cold of winter when that's usually when they break is when like it's the coldest night and they're working the hardest and then they die. Um, do you want to be in that position with an old furnace? I've got like most of my properties have been updated at some point. I'm not going to throw away a mid efficiency furnace for a high efficiency. It just doesn't make sense. If it's working great, not even going to cross that bridge. There was an Ontario program for a while. I don't know if it still exists that allowed um, you get a rebate for a thousand dollars plus 500 if you put the dual stage motor in. So you're getting, uh, what was it? You're getting like 1600 and you get like 15 to 1750. I think it was 1750 back after the total upgrades with the OPA and all these different upgrades they had. And I had a guy installing furnaces for 2000 cash and he did a bunch of my furnaces and they were high efficiency. It was a good deal. And we did a lot of them. We did volume. So we got a good deal in that situation. It made sense because it was $250 per furnace net of the rebates. 
so I did like, we did a lot of, all my investors, we all did furnaces. Like a whole lot of the houses have new furnaces now because for 200 bucks, the energy savings was like a no brainer and like a year you'd get that back. Now, if you're paying out of pocket like $4,000 for a new furnace, it's gonna take a long time to get that return back. And from a resale perspective, you don't get the full value of the furnace back. You'll get like half of it back from a resale perspective at best. So it's not a great perspective if you're gonna sell the property, typically you won't get that money back. There are certain areas you can spend money and get it back, like a kitchen or a bath or flooring and paint, you'll get that back. But some things you don't get back and that's one of them. Uh, but yeah, hopefully that, that helped your question. Now we've got a lot of questions. I'm gonna do a rapid fire round. Would I wait for the warm weather? Yes, if I can wait, I would. How do you cope? And plus you get a better deal. Like the best time to put a furnace in is when the contractors are their slowest. So typically that's fall, early fall and early spring because the HVAC guys all do AC as well, right? So they'll do air conditioning and furnace. So the best time is in between the air conditioning and the furnace cycle. So that's the time to price out um, your HVAC stuff. They'll give you good deals on hot water tanks. Talking about hot water tanks, um, I have a tankless one. I like it. It takes a little bit longer to get the hot water than I'd like. They're not near as efficient as people make them sound. Um, yeah, honestly, there's 99% efficient tankless systems. I like them from a, a rental perspective. If I rent one, they're, they're decent. I like it in a situation where I've got like, I got one house that um, downtown's got 11 bedrooms in it. And so it's a duplex with like six bedroom unit and a five bedroom. It, anyway, um, units like that would do really well with the tankless. Uh, I have another property that has 11 bedrooms in it. It's a triplex and it does, it has like five, five washrooms, has five washrooms. So, and, and laundry, a couple of laundry sets. So a tankless made sense. Cause I was, I was, it was renting, I think it was three Reliance tanks in the, in the storage room. And I put in one tankless system and the Reliance fees were hundred. And I put in the tankless for 40 bucks. I saved $60 a month by upgrading to tankless. So sometimes upgrading from tank to tankless will actually reduce your monthly fees for the rental. If you own it, then you can run the numbers. And I think one tankless system that can produce for all those, all those on demand is worth the money. Like if you had two, if you had two different hot water tanks, it might make sense to put in one tankless and feed the whole place. Especially if like water can't be subdivided between units. Often water comes in at one meter to the building. And so landlord has to pay water anyway. Um, and then gas too sometimes will come as one, one meter. And so it can make sense to, uh, to not do it. But yeah, good question. Thanks for asking. How do you cope with anxiety and worry? So future ways, how do I cope with anxiety and worry? I, of all people, am very high energy and I am very well attuned to market movements and I feel drops in my portfolio, et cetera, more harshly than most because I'm very much capital preservation mindset orientated. Does that make sense? So for me personally, losing $20 feels way worse than making 50. I know that sounds crazy. Like most people are like, I'd rather make 50 bucks. Like I, it feels better to make 50 bucks. But for me to lose 20 bucks feels worse than anything. So when I go into every investment, I look at what is my downside and how do I mitigate that? And I focus on that heavily. So I'm very much downside mitigation type guy, which is contrary to what most people think. Most people think that I'm an upside focused guy because I get so much upside in real estate. That's because I watch my bottom line so closely. I'm so concerned with buying at 70 or 80 cents on the dollar that I make damn sure that if the, I lose 10% or something happens, I've got the margin in the purchase. I buy smart. And so that's, I'm very, very risk avert. Like I, I just, what do you call it? Risk uh, aversive, evasive, avoid risk. I like to avoid risk. I don't know, my, the word's slipping my tongue right now. Uh, I like to avoid risk. So yeah, I think it's a good strategy to employ. A good defense makes it for a good offense. So how do you cope? There are strategies. I have a video coming up soon on the eight parts to a fire life where I do the eight dimensions to having a good life. And it's like the equation to a financially independent good life. So I'm, uh, I'm excited for that video to drop because that's going to be a deeper video than I've done before. And it's at the center of the fire movement. No one's talking about it. Like why are we actually after fire? What is the meaning of of life, how do you define what a good life is and what are some of the components to a fire life? And it's more than just financial. Financial is a piece of it, but it's, uh, it's like the foundation, but it's not the whole house. But yeah, happy to, to share that. That'll help you kind of some strategies, I think, on coping with anxiety and worry. And the biggest thing is telling yourself that you're gonna be okay. Maybe there's like strategies like that that can work for you. There's, you can just Google a ton of strategies 
for that. For myself personally, having that fire FU money has always made me feel comfortable. Like knowing now that I have that, whenever I go into any like meeting or any altercation, or like imagine someone challenges me on something and they're like, I'm done with you and this and that, like when all those bad things are happening, they, most of these people don't have FU money, I do. And so if someone really, like you can imagine like a realtor client, just like something like that yelling at like the realtor, the realtor is like freaking out, afraid to sever the relationship. I'm like, fuck you, like we're done. <laughs> okay, like bye. It's no scale off my back, I don't need the money, right? And so coming from that position, I don't, I'm not hungry for a commission sale. I, I don't care about you know, trying to like make, the, make a deal happen that doesn't need to happen or like trying to appease a client. I can do what I want. And so I, I really think there's something to that for reducing stress and anxiety. Like when you get to that point of, of feeling that way, it can be huge. It can be huge to, to saving your psyche and, and making you feel like you're in control. And I think control is at the corner of anxiety. Oh, super chat. JP34, hey Mike Rossart, just wanted to say thanks for sharing quality content. Hey man, that means a lot. Thank you so much for that $20 super chat. Yeah, super chat. We're telling YouTube that this stream is good. It, uh, other, I guarantee you watch the views in this stream, it'll get over a thousand views now. When it gets super chat, typically if the title is decent and the content's all right, we get, uh, it tells YouTube, because YouTube gets like probably seven or eight dollars of that at least, right? So YouTube just made a bunch of money. They're gonna say to themselves, the streamers enjoyed the stream. We should push it out to more of Mike's audience. We should push it out now to, you know, his, his greater audience or even to people, you know, just uh, in the wild who are coming across my content. So thank you, JP. I work really hard to provide this content every single week consistently for a year and a half. It means a lot to us. Um, we, we do appreciate it. I know YouTube appreciates it. They take their cut and we have to grease, what do you call it? You grease the palm that, like slides the wheel. I, there's a saying, it's like you gotta grease the palm or like oil the wheel. I don't know, that's what we're doing. We're oiling the wheel. So thank you for oiling the wheel. Um, it's not that I like, it's not that I need the money, but it actually does, it, it makes me feel good to know that we're, one, we're not losing money. Um, and two, because I hate losing money in anything that I do and I don't want you two to be a loss center. Right now it's like a neutral center. Um, I've contemplated making this into like some sort of business somehow, but. It just, my heart just isn't in it as a business. I think this is better as a free, like I just give content for free and then if people wanna give back, they can. Um, I, I'm like casually expecting someday someone to just do like a thousand dollar coaching call with me or something. Just saying like, you know, for the last three years I've watched your, your stuff like here. So maybe that's like the long payout or something. I, I don't know, we'll see. But uh, I do appreciate it, it means a lot. If you have any questions, I'm gonna answer those first, I promise. So JP34, did I miss any questions from you here? I'm gonna go up here and see if I missed one. I promise that if someone super chats, they get their question first. So, do, 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 scrolling through the chat, scrolling through the chat. I don't think I missed it. Did I? Just a Waldo comment. Okay, we did the furnace question. So Tommy says, he's got a good question here. So I don't see any question, but if you have one, jump at the bottom. Uh, by the way, I do appreciate the super chats. It means a lot. Is it good to refi in the winter to accelerate buying more properties or would you wait for warmer weather for price increases? So Tommy, it depends. It depends on a lot of factors. Hmm. You can appraise your property any time of the year. It tends to appraise a little bit better. If your landscaping is good and on point, the property should be appraised in the spring or in the summer. If you're it's a rental property and your landscaping doesn't really matter, Appraise at any time of the year. Appraisals aren't hugely affected by weather in the same way that sale price is. Sale price is a factor of supply and demand among other factors, but when it's really cold, the appraiser still comes out if you call them and pay them money. When it's really cold, the buyers don't come out. So that's something to kind of um, kind of think about. Um, yeah. Should you, so I guess the question was, is it good to refi? I would say it's good to refine now so that by December you have cash in hand to buy. So yeah, I would say now is a good time to refinance and then you have gunpowder to fire when the deals are the best. How do you cope with anxiety? We did that one. I have an older property, a triplex built in 1900. I have smelled a musky smell from the crawl space after heavy rains. No visible signs of mold leaks. Any cause for concern? It depends. I don't know. I, I haven't seen it, I can't comment specifically, but 
if it's a crawl space and it's like dirt floor, you could consider, um, this is something that I had done at one of my properties, is putting down vapor barrier on all the dirt and then spray foaming around like the edge of the foundation that's exposed and then just kind of tucking like the, the uh, vapor barrier. That killed all the smell for me and it helped a ton from a, an efficiency standpoint. It's not very hard to insulate a crawl space with some insulation pretty thick and like spray foam for instance because it spray foam seals for water too which is great it helps with the moisture and it solved all of our problems so we had no smell no issue at all after we did that so that's something i recommend um it's like 800 bucks a thousand bucks to spray a crawl space and then you'll you'll get it back in like two three years just in efficiency Am I still alive?